All right, uh, I am uh, J.R. Ryling. Uh, I did uh, my dissertation at Old Dominion University on smart power in the Iraq surge from 2007 to 2008. So today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of my research and results from that. So I'll start talking a little bit about my thesis, go into a little bit of the background on the effectiveness of the surge in Iraq, and then talk a little bit about this normative idea about of smart power, and then maybe what we can do to try to operationalize that as we break it down to what are traditionally called hard and soft power in uh, theoretical literature, and then uh, conclude and take your questions and comments as well. So again, I did my uh, dissertation at Old Dominion University with the International Studies Program. Uh, I focused on the surge in Iraq. Uh, I found that a uh, thing to be of interest. Myself, I have a psychological operations background, so I was certainly interested in that smart power piece when you talk about bringing together the, uh, uh, the hard and soft power uh, elements, trying to develop a coordinated national level plan. Uh, I just uh, presented the, my dissertation earlier this year. So most of my methodology was through interviews, about 40 people who were present in Iraq during the surge. I was also there technically. I left about a month or so after General Petraeus took command. Uh, but a lot of my people there, they worked uh, on staffs. So I was able to get a mix of military folks, State Department folks, different levels, uh, people who worked in different parts of the country doing different things. So I got a pretty good mix of a lot of the people that were doing things and making the decisions there. So the basic thesis I developed from my research and uh, saw was the idea that smart power was an important element of the United States uh, effort in the Iraq surge, the U.S. as well as the coalition and the Iraqis and that this effort was able to marshal and combine attractive and coercive power resources to achieve success. And then we could look at this as something to be a model that could be conducted in the future as well, at least a planning idea as we look at future similar operations. Uh, the graphic is just some power company. I just needed a cool graphic that said smart power on it. I don't even know where they are. Uh, so surge effectiveness, a little bit of background. Of course, the U.S. went into Iraq in 2003 deposed Saddam Hussein's regime, a uh, series of uh, interim and uh, transitional governments were installed. Uh, the uh, insurgent efforts uh, came from several sources, including uh, former regime elements, as well as Shia, who had mostly been out of the power structure uh, under Saddam. And these things increased through, through 2005 and 2006. It got particularly bad after the bombing of the Samara Mosque in early 2006 a Shia mosque uh, bombed by uh, Sunnis, primarily the uh, Al-Qaeda in Iraq uh, guys uh, who were operating in there. So these things had led to a huge amount of violence that was occurring in the country. And at the same time, the U.S. strategy, because the U.S. was trying to build up Iraqi uh, security forces, both police and military, to try to bring the, that force level down and also bringing it back to a smaller number of larger bases strategically placed throughout Iraq. And as a result, there was less security on the ground as this ethnic and sectarian violence was ramping up throughout Iraq. Uh, also, the uh, uh, State Department was hindered at this time. Uh, they were just starting the concept of the Provincial Reconstruction Teams, or the PRTs, which had initially been introduced in Afghanistan. They wanted to bring the concept to Iraq, although it actually had a different focus there. In Afghanistan, it was trying to bring central government control down to the provinces. In Iraq, it was more intended to try to bring up the local provinces and try to reduce their dependence on the central governance and control. But the political process had also stalled out. The Sunnis had boycotted the 2005 elections, which went to a large part of shaping the constitution that they were developing in Iraq. And this continued on as their participation became they increased it in 2006 and 7, but they still really weren't at the level that they were fully participating. And the acceptance of them by the uh, Shia-dominated government was also problematic. So execution for the surge. Uh, General Petraeus was named to command multinational force in Iraq, the four-star command. Uh, and he would uh, also be helped by uh, General Ray Odierno, who had the three-star MNCI, or Corps Command, that was nested underneath that. So uh, General Petraeus, a lot of his focus was on the political and international aspects of what was going on in the surge. General Odierno 
focus more on the uh, tactical, uh, operational level things that were happening within Iraq. Uh, part of what General Petraeus did was uh, even before he got to Iraq doing things to help improve his chances for success there, uh, promulgating a new field manual 3-24 counterinsurgency operations, which the U.S. had not had for uh, several decades, uh, a, a current doctrine for dealing with counterinsurgency. And along with that, uh, he had good political support and he made sure that he went around to Congress, to the executive branch, because he wanted to change the way that we were operating over there in Iraq. Uh, some of the things that he wanted to do was reverse that big base trend, uh, get the uh, U.S. forces out partnering with the Iraqi uh, uh, security forces at joint patrolling stations, which oftentimes were a company level uh, asset that they would bring in and bring into some of these hot areas at the time Baghdad uh, was his primary focus. Most of the surge troops that were brought in were combat forces, uh, brigades that were trying to stabilize the situation and reduce the violence that was occurring in Iraq. Hand in hand with this was an increased State Department surge as well. Uh, this had a smaller number of people, uh, but it was focused on trying to uh, man those provincial reconstruction teams and also partnering with the Iraqi uh, government uh, as well to try to bring them, as we said, not just at the national level, but trying to get it down to the uh, local levels as well, uh, trying to improve governments, uh, governance and just the willingness to make decisions. Uh, by 2007, 2008, the Iraqi government actually had a lot of money coming in. Uh, oil was uh, a large revenue generator as they were bringing that back up. The problem was after 30 years of being under Saddam, all these guys were scared to make decisions. Nobody wanted to spend it. They'd have their budget. They couldn't get them to spend it. Um, so this was part of what State Department had to do. And this is a part of the surge. This is uh, Ambas Ambassador Crocker came in in June. Um, really one of the people as, as much as General Petraeus who helped make the surge successful and made it smart, bringing in those hard and soft power elements. Um, an underappreciated person in that surge, I would say, was Ambassador Crocker. He worked very well with General Petraeus. Uh, my interviewees all talked about how unified they were, always in public, uh, that their decision making and what they were doing, that they got along very well, and that percolated down to the rest of the U.S. and international and coalition effort as well. So, at this, so expanding the military function and then at the same time trying to expand that State Department function giving them more authority and authorization, because again, State Department's not designed to be a wartime organization. Uh, so trying to get these guys uh, permission and security so they can get out and maintain, look at the status of the product, uh, projects that, they're, that we were working on, talking to their Iraqi counterparts, trying to encourage them and improve the level of governance in the country. Certainly, as we saw as a result uh, of this, between the beginning of 2007 and the end of 2008, violence dropped dramatically. This is a chart, they called it the Virginia chart from the way that it shaped out. Uh, this one represents civilian deaths in Iraq, uh, which had been reaching a high point at the end of 2006, end of 2007. It dropped off so dramatically at the end of 2008 that my uh, interviewees said that there were days when there were no war-related deaths in Iraq. Um, which was inconceivable a year and a half or two years earlier. And if you look at other charts for uh, American security forces and Iraqi security forces, you'll see a similar trend, uh, trend up and down as well. Although the Iraqi forces, uh, their casualty levels persisted for several months after the U.S. levels started dropping. So do truly appreciate the fact that this was a combined effort. It wasn't just the U.S. forces. It was partnering with the Iraqi forces and they continued to maintain that, uh, uh, that casualty level until the country was stabilized. So trying to get that done, trying to get uh, economic projects done, uh, getting them up and running, and not just doing them, but trying to do them smarter. And this is part of that coordination piece with the Iraqis, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on, some of the stories of uh, what was happening when that wasn't going right. And just getting back into the governments, trying to bring the Sunnis back in and the uh, military forces, because again, uh, General Petraeus partnered uh, the military, not just with the Iraqi government and trying to build up their security forces, but with the Sunni militias, particularly in Anbar province, there had been the Anbar awakening, 
related to that was uh, an initiative that General Petraeus developed in Baghdad, the Sons of Iraq, bringing the Sunnis in and making them responsible for their own security in their areas. Uh, primarily, and again, this is helped by uh, circumstances, some of the circumstances being that by this time, even the Sunnis were getting tired of the Al-Qaeda guys because of their, the combination of their religious intolerance and indifference to collateral damage from their operations had made them more or less unwanted house guests. So this was actually a situation where the Sunnis were coming to the Americans and saying, just give us the weapons and we'll get rid of these guys for you. So you had that as a fortuitous circumstance that helped uh, economic growth. Uh, oil prices were kind of on the uptick uh, at this time, so sometimes fortunate factors can work for you as well. But basically you can look at the surge and the surge action uh, from two, early 2007 to 2008 as doing a tremendous effort in reducing the level of violence in Iraq and allowing reconstruction, uh, governance, and other advancement to proceed. All right, so what is smart power? Uh, certainly us social scientists all like to talk about smart power and bandy it about. The thing to remember about it, of course, is it's a normative term. Um, it's a subjective term because when you start talking about trying to combine hard power and soft power, then by its very nature, um, it's, there's no exact recipe. I can't tell you that it, you need an exact 50-50 mix of hard and soft power in order to achieve the objectives that you want. Uh, so when we're looking at trying to say something is a smart power uh, thing, it's going to be different for every situation. It may be different even within situations that you have. Uh, so if you look at smart power as this proper ratio, you're not going to find that. I pulled up this just because that's one Hollywood staple you always see. Anytime the movies where there's a siege or a hostage situation, the police, uh, uh, the authorities are always divided into two groups. There's the tactical guys who want to storm in and end the whole thing in 30 seconds, and then there's the negotiator guy who says, well, wait, give me a little bit more time. Maybe I can talk this thing through. Uh, so trying to find that right mix is always going to be a challenge. It's going to change in situations, from situation to situation. It's going to change within a situation. I had brigade commanders who were interviewees who told me that on any given day, on one end of town, I might be conducting a uh, reconstruction and engineering mission, and on the other side of town, I'm kicking in doors, doing a cordon and search. Uh, so being prepared and being flexible is going to be an important part of trying to make smart power work. All right, so hard and soft power are also going to have subcategories, and I think that's one of the little tricks. A lot of time we talk about hard and soft power, and we tend to think of it as a binary construct. Uh, my next slide, I'll have a chart up, which kind of gives you more of a spectrum of when you look at hard and soft power activities, because certainly uh, hard power activities, you can bomb a house, but maybe, you know, recalling your diplomats, doing a cordon and search, uh, checkpoints, things like these can also be looked at as uh, hard power uh, elements. So this was the definition that my uh, dissertation chair uh, asked me to work on and, and come up with. This is what I developed, something to try to uh, bring smart power in. Uh, the key things that you have there, of course, because it's normative, the combination and to efficiently accomplish objectives. So it's, again, it's going to be a normative thing. Smart power uh, it's going to change from situation to situation, and so it's going to be incumbent upon the leadership to look at a situation and determine what that right mix is going to be and how that's going to change over the course of time as well. All right, so power, uh, actually the chart will be on the next slide, uh, trying to operationalize power. Again, we talked about that soft and hard power. Those are what you commonly see uh, in the theoretical literature and neither my chair or I were very happy with those as I'm trying to start work on doing the interviewing and trying to come up with data and developing data to, uh, uh, to verify whether smart power is working uh, in the region. So he told me, well, all right, since you're a career military person, operationalize hard and soft power for me. What do we mean by those? Give me something in operational terms that we can measure, that we can look at, uh, you know, that we can, that just goes beyond this theoretical construct that you see with hard and soft power. Uh, Dr. Joseph Nye talked a lot about 
hard power being coercion and hard power being attraction. So I thought about what uh, my chair talked to me about and thought about that for a few days. And so I came back with a couple of definitions to operationalize power. So I said that coercive power is actions whose consequences the recipient would not want repeated. Attractive power, actions whose consequences the recipient would want repeated. All right, I think really I used the first graphic just so I could say I must break you during my briefing. But uh, just the idea, the idea being this is something that we can maybe look at and measure to try to get beyond theoretical constructs and try and get an idea of what we mean when we talk about coercive power, all right, forcing someone to do something versus attractive power where they're coming to you and they want to participate in the action with you. All right, so uh, hopefully, did we, were we able to post that summary up uh, on the chat board? Uh, if you have that uh, summary that I sent out, that should have a copy of the chart on it because um, it, it is a little bit complicated, unfortunately. Uh, but basically, the idea of what's happening here is what you have is the spe you know, what I developed this idea of the spectrum that goes from that extremely coercive to extremely attractive powers. Uh, so you can look at things like bombing a house or uh, erecting barriers and economic sanctions. So again, not all of it's necessarily military. Some of it are diplomatic efforts that you can look at as well as being coercive powers, uh, things that the recipient is not going to want repeated as opposed to starting into more of the positive things when you start talking about those joint presence patrolling uh, that we were doing during the surge, uh, that we're doing uh, informational campaigns, and then civic action things as well, reconstruction and things like that. Uh, I'll go in a little bit more detail about some of these later on. I will point out the chart is not rigorous. Uh, so if we get to question time and you ask me, hey, JR, how come you have a six here instead of a seven? I'm probably going to roll my eyes at you. Uh, what I'm looking at at this point is just a generalized concept, okay, just to get across that idea that coercive and attractive power, don't just think of them as a binary thing. There's a wide range of options that are available to a decision maker that you can combine to try to get the effects that you want in your operational environment. And again, I had talked about some of the things here, you know, who's not going to want more of this action, who's going to want more of the action, and you can think of that even, even when you start talking about those coercive pieces, you know, think of it as home. If the guy down the street in the house down the street, if he's running an opium den out of his house, unless you're one of his customers, you're quite happy when the police come in and break up that operation, all right? So keep in mind, you know, coercive power, it's not all negative. There are people, you know, we're, we appreciate uh, having uh, coercive power if there are bad elements that need to be dealt with. I had given these time and permanence ratings, basically uh, faster and more permanent is better uh, so that you look at uh, these things as well, and that can be an advantage or a disadvantage to a decision maker as they're looking at uh, planning these things out, uh, the time and decision pieces, uh, the time decision, and then how permanent it's going to be. And then, of course, the other problem being the unintended consequences. You know, what's going to happen as a result of this, if I do this and, do th and uh, take care of this problem, is it going to create other problems in my wake? Particularly when you look at those coercive power pieces and you start talking about international opinion and uh, force morale and things like this, those are going to become strong issues as we're looking at uh, as a decision maker trying to see what and select what they think would be the right combination of resources to apply to a given situation. All right, so in line with that spectrum, that means that we could decide that coercive power is the correct power to use in a situation, but we might still pick the wrong type of coercive power within that. All right, we may not need to bomb the house. Maybe the negotiator will uh, be able to get us uh, get the people to talk out uh, talk and uh, give themselves up without having to blow up the house conversely the other way we don't want to show up somewhere to serve a warrant and end up with a Waco situation where we get met with a hail of automatic uh, gunfire so keeping in mind that with that spectrum just because we decide the situation is going to call for coercive or attractive power you know what we'd like to see is is decision makers still understanding there are choices within that. There are different choices which be, may be more or less correct for a given situation. All right. An action itself can be coercive or attractive. Um, when we look at the action, for example, we can look and say that creating a European Union 
was a attractive action, but as our Spanish student Jesus so excellently pointed out last month ago, what if you had tried to do an EU 100 years ago in Europe? All right? They were not going to do it voluntarily. If you walked up to France and Germany and said, hey guys, why don't you tear down your borders and adopt a common currency in 1922, all right, they both would have thought that was the funniest thing they heard all month. All right? So to do a European Union and create a common currency in Europe, it would have had to have been coercive. All right? As a, because they weren't ready for it. They weren't ready to accept it. They weren't attracted to the idea as they became uh, towards the end of the uh, uh, 20th century. And even within an action itself, it can have coercive and attractive elements. Uh, when Ambassador Bremer took over the uh, Coalition Provisional Administration in 2003, his first act was um, disempowering the, the Ba'athist party. Uh, you know, about 20,000 people were disempowered by that. So certainly, uh, the, primarily Sunnis who were the Ba'athists who are being disenfranchised as a result of that, they're not going to be happy about it. But at the same time, the Shia are quite happy about it. The Shia who had been underrepresented in Iraqi leadership for over a century. So looking at that same action, it's going to have positive and negative uh, elements, even though the primary focus at the time was towards the Sunnis and towards the, uh, the former Ba'athist elements. All right, one in particular that I wanted to talk about, talk about and this is why I liked uh, operationalizing uh, coercion and attraction as measurements of power uh, is because of bribes. I've frequently seen uh, social scientists often categorize bribes as hard power. Um, I don't think it's a coercive power. I think it's an attractive power. Most people are happy to take your bribes as, as long as you want to keep handing them the money. I think the reason that we call it hard power is because we find it odious. All right? Most of us, you know, who wants to admit that you've got to pay somebody to get them to do what you want them to do? I think most people aren't, you know, they, they don't like that. And so I think there's a subconscious thing that goes on that makes us say, oh, well, bribes are hard power. But in reality, I don't think that they are. I think it's an it's a, uh, attractive power, uh, and, you know, and certainly it is, a, it, it is a one way to get people to do what you want. But if you had looked at my chart, one of the things that I said also is that it's the most transitory. Right? The action is going to last for as long as you maintain the bribe. Uh, nonetheless, I would treat bribes as an attractive power, and I would not consider it a hard power. All right, so we can look at power. Uh, another example uh, of picking the right type but doing the wrong thing is when we talk about coordinated versus uncoordinated civic action. You know, when we first went into Iraq and Afghanistan, um, a lot of times we, we followed that bad habit that the U.S. often has that we come in and we tell people what they need instead of letting them tell us what they want. And so as a consequence, we started a lot of civic actions which didn't really have a lot of popular support. And a lot of ten them tended to be very big dollar items, and so there were continual problems with looting, corruption that's occurring, and I think a lot of that is happening simply because you're not getting buy-in from the local population on this action that you want to do. All right, the story, that, that my best story that emphasizes this is this background picture uh, one of my interviewees, he was a squadron commander in Baghdad prior to the surge, and in his area was this uh, lion, this fountain, and it's got the little lions around it, and when he got there, it wasn't working. A general officer directed him to repair it. So he spent over $200,000 getting this thing back operational. If you look really closely in the picture, you can see the majestic streams of water spouting up from it. That is from the one day that he got it operational during the time that he was in Iraq. He said within three weeks, everything of value had been looted out of it, all the grass around it was dead, it was right back like it was when he, uh, when he had first gotten there. So the next time he was meeting with the, uh, one of his uh, uh, guys who was a member of the Iraqi Neighborhood Advisory Council, and he asked that guy, hey, you guys, you know, could you maybe push some funds over so that we could repair this fountain? And the guy looked at him and said, Nobody cares about the lions except you. Right? So to me, that story so perfectly summarizes so much of what we were doing wrong in Iraq and Afghanistan in the early days. Going in, not coordinating with the local people, just deciding something, 
spending a lot of money on it that just ends up enriching contractors and looters at the end. But in the end, the people didn't have any buy-in for it. It wasn't something that they wanted. So you just end up with a wasted effort. It's just a lot of money that ends up being wasted. And that's a shame. And it doesn't, you know, it's a shame for everybody. It's a shame for the U.S. taxpayers who put that money in. It's a shame for the locals because they say, you know, th these guys don't even listen to us. You know, we, we try and tell them what we need done, and they don't listen to us. Uh, you know, they go off and they do projects like this. So, again, looking within uh, coercive and attractive powers, it's a large spectrum. You know, we want to try to make sure that what we're doing is going to be right for a particular situation. All right, so that was most of what I had today, talking a little bit, um, again, talking about my thesis and the work that I did. Uh, very interesting research, again, talking to these guys. Um, most of them were very generous with their time. It's, uh, you know, it's been uh, almost 15 years, so some of them have gone on to bigger and better things, so they were very kind to take time to talk to me. Uh, very interesting insights about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan as well, because a lot of them went to Afghanistan uh, subsequently when we did the mini surge there. Tried to take some of the lessons that we applied to Iraq over there. Some of them worked, some of them didn't work as successfully. Uh, but talked about that effectiveness of the Iraq surge itself, and really, you know, they were able to maintain the uh, um, maintain it as a stable environment even after the U.S. left for a couple of years until they started having the ISIS problems out in the West. Uh, but uh, Iraq is still there, you know, it, it still functions. Um, so, you know, you could certainly look at a lot of that coming about as a result of the surge and providing a stable environment that gave the Iraqis themselves a chance to try to rebuild and do what they felt was necessary to uh, improve their country. And then talked a little bit about smart power uh, the normative term that we love in the, the uh, international community, but just that I, you know, just the idea that if you're looking at smart, smart power, it's going to be a mix. It's probably going to change every day, every situation you're in, and it may change during the day. Um, so what we hope to have is leadership and uh, uh, support that can adapt to those situations as they occur. Uh, and then finally, power itself, uh, based on the charge that I had from my thesis chair, the idea of trying to give us some, something that we can work with as far as an operational level, uh, operationalizing both coercive and attractive power. Uh, so hopefully that that's something that can be a useful tool for decision makers in the future. The, uh, the question is on uh, using information. Um, sounds like there's, there's two parts. Um, exposing bribery and corruption by uh, Iraqi officials, absolutely. That was a huge ongoing effort. Um, and that was part of the benefit you got of putting the military back in at lower levels that were finding this stuff. When everybody's sitting on Camp Liberty, we're not going to find out about it. But there was certainly a big effort that, you know, if, uh, if judges get thrown out of office, you know, if, if uh, commanders get relieved, if politicians are found, we did want to publicize that. And that was an important part of uh, information operations. We talk about that psychological operations as well as public affairs. Um, you know, everybody, we, we absolutely wanted to publicize any instances of that uh, that we found. Accountability did make a difference, and I think you can see that when the U.S. forces left in 2011 after that, you started seeing a lot of the traditional problems had resurfaced because there, there weren't watchers there, uh, you know, international uh, watchers. Uh, as far as statistically, most of our guys, uh, you know, if they were out on patrols, if they talked to uh, the local Iraqis, it, it, it would come up as a topic of conversation, you know, that, yeah, we're, we're glad you got rid of that guy. He was, you know, he was a dirtbag, uh, you, know, you know, we all knew it. So uh, I think you did see positive resonance from that, you know, if you were able to uh, uh, talk about that, uh, you know, and talk about that in your campaign, your information campaign. Part of why, you know, when, if you look at what General Petraeus moved back those, uh, those uh, outposts and the, the security stations, they're joint stations. He wanted Iraqis there, you know, that that should be, that the Iraqi people should see Iraqis doing that. Um, and yeah, absolutely, who makes the call? Because sure, the, the, the crack house call could be coming from the crack house two doors down who's just trying to eliminate his competition. Uh, so it's not a perfect system, but... I suppose it beats having two crack houses in your neighborhood. But absolutely, when you're doing that type of thing, and you know, during the surge, they recognized that, that we wanted to, you know, the, the phrase is put, a, put an Iraqi face on it, put a local face on it. 
uh, and that was always a, uh, a big effort and in conjunction with the public affairs and the uh, psychological operations guys as well to make sure that's getting publicized. So as, as these things are being done, uh, both because especially providing stability, because our end strategy is eventually we want to pull the U.S. forces out so that they can go home. So an important part of that is going to be the information piece of what the Iraqi forces are doing as they're building their capabilities so that the population is in fact going to feel confident that yes, we can reach a point where the Americans can go home. So hopefully that answers that. Uh, that that's a great question. Basically, uh, as you're doing reconstruction and moving forward initiatives, um, which you perceive as attractive, you know, is everyone else necessarily going to see that? Um, you know, and, and how do you mitigate against that? And anytime you make a change, somebody's going to be unhappy about it. Somebody's going to, you know, somebody liked the way the status quo was. And in these, you know, in these parts of the world, uh, you know, because we had the similar issue with the parliament, you know, they wanted a certain representation, certain percentage to be women. Well, you know, if you have a 500 member parliament and you decide 100 of the members need to be women, if it's traditionally been a male dominated society, you just effectively disenfranchised 100 guys who used to be part of the parliament. You know, they, they would have been part of the parliament in the old system, and you know, now they're not. Um, and it, it is a challenge. You know, when, when we went into Iraq, one of the first things that we did was end the sanctions. Um, hey, that's a great thing. That's an attractive thing. Well, what about the tribes in Anbar province who were making a nice living, smuggling in all the stuff you know, that had been outlawed under the sanctions? And, in, in fact, they ended up being some of that first resistance points, and they were very amenable when Al-Qaeda came in with stacks of cash and said, hey, we want you to smuggle our guys and our weapons in you know, for the insurgency campaign. It, it is a challenge, and I think that's often something that decision makers ha have a problem understanding. Someone's going to be unhappy about any change that you make. So what are you doing to prepare for that? What are you going to do to mitigate that? Um, I would argue that that's part of your public affairs and your uh, psychological operations can help with that uh, to help the populace understand, here's the benefits of doing this. You know, by, by being more inclusive, by bringing in a greater, you know, specifically for the women's issue, you know, by you're bringing in smart minds. You know, you got a lot of smart people who have a different perspective on things. If you bring them in, you're probably going to get a better product at the end, the legislation, the governance that you're trying to do. By being more inclusive, you know, our experience in you know, other countries uh, of the world is, you know, as you, bring, as you bring in more people and it's not, you know, you won't just have a gender problem, you can have an ethnicity problem, a religious problem, all these groups, you know, so it's, it's trying to make that persuasive argument, which not everybody buys, that the more people you bring in, it's going to benefit you in the long run. The more you include, you're going to bring in better minds, you're going to bring in better talent. You know, you're basically broadening your recruiting pool the more you're doing that. You know, and same thing for ending the sanctions. Um, you know, maybe that's the type of situation where you look at having some kind of economic alternate plan for these tribes. You know, hire them to contract in to bring in the supplies for our troops. You know, maybe something like that would be an alternative that you can do instead of just taking their livelihood away. You know, a lot of times now we've improved a lot when we tried to demobilize the militias and opposition elements, our DDR programs, demobilization, uh, you know, reintegration, disarming, and just the idea being, okay, you know, this was a 20-year-old kid who's been carrying around an AK-47. We got to have an alternate plan for him, you know, or he's just going to get another AK-47 and he's just going to join the next group. So it's, it's a continual challenge, you know, and not everybody's going to buy it, you know, uh, even at first initially. Your best hope can be that as you carry on, as things stabilize, as the situation improves, that hopefully more and more people will come around to the idea that, okay, this is not a bad way to do it. Uh, talking to other smart people to help you come up with these smart power solutions, um, and absolutely with our guys, you know, we talked about how the, the military and the uh, uh, civilian branches in the U.S. government worked more closely hand in hand. Uh, but international community, like for insurgency, uh, the uh, General Petraeus's deputy was a, uh, uh, a U.K. general, uh, Graham Lamb, Grambo. Um, and he was, the, the British were a great uh, one to talk to about the counterinsurgency environment because they're the ones who've been, they've been dealing with Ireland. You know, most of these guys spent a significant portion of their careers 
uh, dealing with the troubles in Ireland. So that was one of Lamb's great talking points that he was always hammering the Americans with was an equitable solution has to include everybody. And he said, it was tough for me when I was a commander to try to sit down with IRA guys who were swinging pipes at my lads a month ago, but I'm not going to get a lasting settlement if I don't bring those guys in. Uh, the UN, absolutely, you know, when we do elections in these areas, the UN usually runs them because they're pretty good at running them. Um, they need help sometimes getting the word out. Uh, they need help with the security support, but absolutely working with them. Of course, the problem with the UN was uh, most of their presence was pulled out because they had the bombing in 2003. Uh, there was a, a suicide bombing at the, the UN headquarters there in Baghdad, uh, which was actually, I, I believe that is still the UN's greatest loss of life in a single day. Um, but uh, using them and international partners, because a lot of them are going to have experience with food relief. Uh, if you're in Afghanistan, demining, you know, these are guys that they know about all about those things. And certainly uh, my uh, interviewees talked at great length about trying to use those guys. Because again, with those PRTs, the provincial reconstruction teams, the, the State Department guys aren't the ones that are out there building schools. They're contracting with locals. Uh, they're contracting with non-governmental organizations. You know, so absolutely part of that uh, unity of effort uh, that you can bring in. The more of these guys that you talk to, a lot of them you're going to find are going to be better at doing most of the things than you are anyway. Uh, so getting in with those guys, my interviewees talked about that over and over, about how as they expanded those networks, that that helped them more effectively carry out what they wanted to do. We talk about uh, the sender versus the receiver as far as their perceptions of an action. Um, and absolutely, that was you know, some of the things that, that I talked a little bit about, that different target audiences in that area can you know, consider it a, a coercive or an attractive power, uh, depending on how it's geared to. In psychological operations, you know, when we, we always try to look at the target audience. You know, to a certain extent, um, it, they're the one who it really matters, you know, what you what you want and you know what what they want and what they perceive uh, so that as you're doing your messaging and your actions eventually it's to try to sway them um, and that can be a challenge again if we haven't done the good coordination if we haven't really interacted with them enough uh, we can find themselves we find ourselves at a disadvantage because we don't really understand these guys and we can be applying the wrong thing um, I think for uh, if you look at the uh, U.S. decision-making, coalition decision-making, um, again, there's a tendency to look at it through our prism instead of looking at it through their prism, uh, and that can lead to a lot of those wrong actions. But there, again, there are folks who can help you mitigate that. There should be your, uh, your State Department folks. A lot of the uh, military folks will have a, a, a Paul Mill, a polit political advisor, uh, who's on his staff as well. A lot of times for me, uh, talking to the, uh, the interpreter staff that you had there, uh, but just getting out as well and, and talking to folks um, to, to make sure that the message that you want is going to have the impact that you want um, and, and not understand their perspective. Uh, quick story, when I was in Afghanistan, we were, we were looking at a PSYOP campaign to, uh, you know, to, to try to explain to the Afghans why we were there. Uh, so as part of the pre-testing, I was going out and I was showing them pictures of just various things. I, had, I went with a medical capabilities, which is a great, if you want to talk to about 50 or 100 of the locals who are standing around with nothing to do, go along with the medical capabilities, you know, the guys that are, you know, giving shots and checking their kids and things like that. So I'm showing pictures like George Bush, it's about 50 guys here, and I mean, it's, it's an isolated part of Afghanistan. So I'm showing a picture of George Bush, virtually none of them recognized him, picture of Osama bin Laden. Uh, a lot of them did, but not as many as you would think. And then I showed a picture of the trade towers burning, and two of the guys out of the 50 correctly identified that it was you know, the trade towers after the 9-11 attacks. After I talked to these guys, I was back at the Humvee, and my interpreter told me, he said, you know, there were only five of those, about five of those guys who even recognized the objects in the picture as buildings. You know, so to me, Similar to the lion story, if you don't understand your population and, and how they perceive things, your, your message or your actions are, you know, could end up, in fact, having the opposite effect of what you want. So you know, to me, that's what I would say the, the lesson from that, because 
it's important how they perceive it. Being able to pretest, being able to talk to people, being able to do assessment. You know, it's, hey, well, you know, it ties right into our lesson that we had today.